Mom, Dad's going to kill us. We have to get out now. I woke up in the middle of the night to the sound of my son screaming. The smell of burning flesh woke me further, soon followed by smoke filling the room where we slept. There's a fire. We have to get out of here right now, I exclaimed. I hurried to open the door to our room, but the doorknob wouldn't budge. It seemed locked with something. I felt despair creeping in, thinking we had lost our way out, and it might be the end of us. Then, my ten-year-old son shouted, no time to dwell. His quick thinking saved us, and we began our escape. Later, we sought revenge against my husband. I, Violet, 38 years old, had graduated from college and worked for an advertising agency. I married my former colleague, Darren, 12 years ago, and together we have a son. Darren loves motorcycles and spends his days off doing maintenance on them. Our son, Roger, has a keen interest in solving cases on TV, often deducing suspects and motives. His accuracy surprises me, as he's often right when the suspect is caught. When Roger was younger, Darren adored him, but over time, he stopped interacting with him, dismissing Roger's insights as mere childish guesses. One day, while Darren was in the bath, Roger entered the study, sniffed the suit on the hanger, and asked, Mom, has Dad changed his place of work recently? No, he's been a salesman at the same agency for a long time, I replied. Roger explained, when Dad came home earlier, he mentioned being busy at work and going out in this heat all day, but his suit doesn't smell sweaty at all. I think he used deodorant. He'll get angry if you go into the study, so you should leave now, Roger persisted still not convinced. However, as the bathroom door opened, he had no choice but to leave the study. Returning to the living room with a notebook, Roger said to my husband, my school teacher gave me homework on what kind of work my dad does. What's the name of your company and what do you do? I work in sales for the Scan Advertisement Agency. My husband replied, surprisingly detailed in his response. Unlike his usual interactions with Roger, Later, during dinner, my husband suddenly lost his appetite and excused himself to bed without eating. Daddy is tired. Let him have dinner at least, I said, trying to ease the tension. I told you what his job is, didn't I? I'm sorry, but there's something that's been bothering me, Roger said. Did you see how he kept putting his hand on his throat when he was talking to me? It's a behavior often seen in courtrooms where the perpetrator makes such a gesture when someone gets to the point. It also bothered me that he was staring at me with his eyes glazed over. You know, when you lie, you don't look away. It's usually the other way around. My son's reasoning, which I usually dismissed, seemed credible to me. Until just a few months ago, my husband was the kind of person who, when he came home from work, would leave his bag to me and rush off to take a bath because he was worried about the smell of sweat. But before I knew it, he started handling his belongings himself, even putting his suits and pants away in his study. He only handed them to me when needed for cleaning. Maybe he is hiding something from me. Feeling anxious, I waited until I was sure my husband was asleep before quietly searching through his pants pockets. My heart raced as I found a receipt for a lavish lunch costing 20,000 yen from a fancy restaurant in a hotel far from where my husband claimed to have been. Startled, I felt a presence behind me and turned to see my husband holding a glass of water. What are you doing in my study? He demanded. I thought it was time to take your trousers to the cleaners. I stammered, dropping the receipt. He picked it up, his expression horrified. I didn't ask for it. You act like a thief at this time of night. You've got to be kidding me. Don't be so angry just because I saw a receipt in your pocket, I pleaded. I can't be with a sneaky. Get out of here right now. He interrupted, his voice rising. He slammed the cup on the desk, startling our son, who rushed out asking what was wrong. Roger tried to intervene, but my husband's anger didn't subside. As tensions escalated, my husband began emptying his bag onto the floor. A prepaid cell phone and a business card case both unfamiliar to me, fell out. What are you doing with a prepaid cell phone when you have a smartphone? I questioned, bewildered. 
I'm using it for work, he snapped. But you don't really go to work, do you? I pressed, my suspicion growing. And this business card isn't right. I exclaimed, feeling a surge of alarm. Stop it. Don't touch my stuff, he bellowed, growing increasingly agitated. He then forcibly kicked me and our son out of the study, leaving us reeling with shock and confusion. My son began to tamper with my husband's phone, which was charging in the living room. I whispered a warning, urging him not to provoke my husband further. Don't do this. Don't get on his nerves anymore, I cautioned. It will be over soon, my son assured me cryptically, operating something on the phone. After that, I left my husband in the study and retreated to my own bedroom with my son. The questions about the extra phone lingered in my mind, but dwelling on them didn't provide answers. I resolved to keep a close watch and confront my husband directly when the time was right. The next morning, I woke up to the sound of my husband packing his luggage. Concerned, I asked if he was planning to leave because of our argument. His response surprised me. I just got a call from the company. I have to go on a business trip to New York, he explained. They'd opened a new branch there since I quit. Also, I need you to get some kerosene for me. I'll be using it to do maintenance on my bike during the summer. I'll be back tomorrow at noon, so make sure you have it ready by the end of the day. I felt relieved hearing my husband's calm tone, a stark contrast from the tension of the previous day. Yet I couldn't shake the feeling that something about him seemed off, different from his usual self. After sending Darren out, I arranged for kerosene to be delivered from the gas station, despite it being out of season. Later, as the end of the school day approached before summer vacation, my son was surprised by the unusual delivery. He seemed to hesitate for a moment, and I understood his unspoken thoughts, but decided not to pursue them further. That night, as I lay in bed trying to sleep, my son joined me, sensing my unease. It was the first time we'd slept together in a long while. Suddenly, in the middle of the night, he woke me up with a scream. As I opened my eyes, Roger urgently pulled my hand. We're going to be killed by Daddy. Let's get out of here right now, he exclaimed. Confused, I smelled burning and saw fire outside the window. Coughing from the smoke, I tried to leave the room. But the door wouldn't budge. I couldn't shake the image of Darren asking me to buy kerosene. Trapped on the second floor, I felt hopeless. But Roger didn't give up. He quickly directed me to the water server, telling me to shower and tying sheets together for an escape. We climbed out the window onto the first floor, where the wind helped clear the smoke. As we watched our home burn, I cried, feeling like I was in a nightmare. But Roger remained strangely composed. My guess was right. I've got your phone, so I'll check it out, he said calmly. Panic rose within me. What if you have my phone? We need to call the fire department. I insisted. No, I don't want Dad to know we're alive, Roger replied, his focus unwavering as he operated his phone. I put a GPS app on his phone last night. He's right in our neighborhood. I couldn't believe it. You're kidding? I murmured, overwhelmed. Stay calm, Mom. I'm here with you. It's going to be okay. Roger reassured me. Let's get somewhere safe. Before we left, Roger made anonymous calls to the fire department to ensure our neighbor's safety. I marveled at his actions as we bought clothes and sought refuge in a nearby business hotel. I checked my husband's whereabouts again and discovered he was at a luxury hotel about a 30-minute drive from our house, just as my son had suggested. The thought made me shiver uncontrollably. Unable to shake off the feeling of dread, I spent a sleepless night pondering how to confirm the truth. The next afternoon, while watching TV, the news showed our burned-down house and my husband, tearfully pleading for information about us. But something about his expression seemed off to me. That's a typical fake crying expression. I muttered to myself, analyzing his demeanor. Why you think that? He's pretending to be sad, but the corners of his mouth are upturned my son observed astutely. It's because he thinks it's funny to fool people. As I scrutinized my husband's face, I noticed the subtle grin tugging at the corners of his mouth. If this was Darren's true nature, my son might be in danger again. Determined not to sit idly by, 
I decided to keep an eye on him. I don't want to be alone, my son insisted, refusing to stay behind. Reluctantly, I agreed, and we headed to the luxury hotel together, relying on GPS. While waiting, my husband emerged from the hotel, his demeanor light and carefree, humming to himself. Without hesitation, he entered a nearby house, which we later discovered belonged to an elderly woman. Minutes later, he emerged with a black bag, which he hadn't been carrying earlier. Curious, he then entered a park, leaving the bag behind upon his exit. Suspicious of his behavior, but lacking concrete evidence, we watched as my son bravely approached the house and rang the intercom. An elderly woman answered, and my son's expression saddened. My dad came here earlier, didn't he? Did he give you a business card identical to this one? He asked, presenting a banker's business card. The woman nodded and retrieved an identical card from her purse, her surprise evident when shown our family photo. She explained that she had recently lost her husband and was living alone. This morning, she had received a call claiming her husband had an inheritance in a hidden account, but she needed to pay an inheritance fee. They were returning tomorrow to collect the remainder. Realization dawned on me. Dad is doing something wrong, my son asserted. If my husband is deceiving you, I can't forgive him. Will you help me find out the truth? In addition, I shared our situation with Ms. Hallman, who nodded in agreement, having seen it on the daytime news. Determined to confront my husband, I hastily prepared for the next day. As expected, my husband arrived at Ms. Hallman's house at 7 o'clock p.m. to collect the money. He then proceeded to the same park as the previous day. You, I began, my voice laced with resentment as my son, and I confronted him from the shadows. My husband's knees buckled, trembling in fear. It was you who put us through hell, wasn't it? My son accused, his tone seething with anger. You set our house on fire with the kerosene you made me buy for your motorcycle maintenance lie. Trembling with fear, my husband stammered out an apology. My son dropped his banker business card at his feet, mocking his deceit. It's funny how you have so many of these when you're not a banker. Are you scamming people? My son questioned, his words piercing through my husband's defenses. Feeling intolerant, I stepped forward, staring him down. We saw what was in your bag. You didn't want us to find out, so you tried to end us, didn't you? My husband hesitated, reluctant to confess. Disgusted, I confronted him further, demanding answers. Why did you commit fraud? I demanded, my voice trembling with anger. Was it just for money? My husband's feeble attempts to evade only fueled my frustration. Please be gone already, he pleaded desperately, but it was too late. The detective, hidden in the shadows, emerged, seizing my husband as he confessed to everything. My husband's surprise was palpable as he was handcuffed and led away by the police. After seeing him off, my son and I exchanged a triumphant fist bump. We had done it. My husband was apprehended, and justice was served. My husband was sentenced to a long prison term for fraud and arson. The black bag, given to an online accomplice, led to another arrest. I filed for divorce and demanded compensation for emotional distress. With the insurance money, I bought a new house, determined to start afresh with my son by my side. In our conversations, I discovered my son's dream of becoming a detective. I vowed to support him in achieving his future aspirations, determined to move forward from the ordeal stronger than ever before.